If you're at all interested in pushing your performance, productivity or creativity, then it's hard not to get excited by the concept of flow states. Flow states are states of optimal human performance. This is your performance when you're 100% focused on a single task. It's you with zero distractions when all your mental and physical resources are called upon. So what's really happening here? Well, I've addressed the psychology of flow states before. To briefly recap, the generally agreed explanation is that when a specific activity seems important and challenging enough, we allow our prefrontal cortex to switch off. This state is technically known as transient hypofrontality. Our mind stops wandering, distractions fall away, and instead we become creatures of pure instinct. There is only the present moment and the challenge in front of us. I liken this to driving and talking. When we drive and talk on the phone at the same time, we may think that we're still able to respond quickly, but in fact we're four times more likely to have an accident because our attention is divided. Your internal monologue can do the exact same thing to you when you're playing a computer game or sparring with an opponent, distracting your attention away from the present moment. This unique pattern of activity in the brain also triggers the release of specific neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, and anandamide. Neurochemically, this is very similar to a fight or flight response, except we're calmer and more in control. Our brainwaves also slow down and enter a theta state. And whether we're writing an essay, rapping, engaged in conversation, snowboarding or fighting, our performance improves. At least this is the popular narrative. It's a nice little bedtime story. But there are issues with this idea, and that's what I want to break down in this two-part video series. Here in part one, I'll be discussing the true nature of a flow state, and in part two, I'll be talking about how to hack that flow state in order to bring it on at will. So for starters, I've often questioned how a flow state can be beneficial for writing an essay if it causes your prefrontal cortex to shut down. This is the part of the brain we use for planning, problem solving, and reasoning. So if we lose these abilities, how can we possibly work better? The answer, as it turns out, is to do with the precise part of the prefrontal cortex that shuts down. Specifically, it's an area called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that shuts off, while the medial prefrontal cortex remains active during creative tasks. This makes a lot of sense, seeing as the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is at least partly responsible for our sense of self, whereas the medial prefrontal cortex is all about the internal generation of ideas. So this way we can maintain our creativity and our planning whilst losing our self-concern and our little nagging voice of doubt. This was what was seen when looking at the brains of rappers during improvisation. So it seems that the prefrontal cortex in fact shuts down selectively rather than entirely, and this is why we can still plan and be creative while being entirely focused on a single task. But I'm still not convinced that flow states are just this one thing, because when you are focused deeply on writing an essay or having a fascinating conversation, you don't tend to experience that cascade of neurotransmitters. When was the last time you were writing an essay and your heart rate went through the roof and you started shaking? If you want to learn how to get into creative flow state, then check out my video on focus. But if it's ultra instinct like high performance you're more interested in, then what can you do? So that's the other reason I think that it's folly, folly I say, to consider a flow state purely in terms of hyperfrontality. Because there's another way you can shut down your prefrontal cortex, through stress. Any fight or flight response will cause you to produce cortisol, norepinephrine and dopamine. When was the last time you were nervous in an interview or scared for your life and you weren't 100% focused? Stress hormones shut down your prefrontal cortex in just the same way, and cortisol is particularly damaging to your hippocampus and your ability to store memories. This is why you might stutter when you're speaking publicly, and it's why you get the yips in golf. This is sometimes referred to as giving yourself a self-lobotomy. So it's funny how the prefrontal cortex is at the root of all evil when someone's selling a book on flow states, and it's the most important part of your brain when someone is selling a stress management technique. Simplicity sells. But are we to say that every time you're stressed, you're in a flow state? No, I didn't think so. Speaking anecdotally, you often hear people advise that you relax into flow. In other words, they suggest that you enter a flow state by first being highly stressed and then finding a state of calm within that stress, the eye of the storm. Cortisol may completely impair your higher functioning brain regions, including the likes of the medial prefrontal cortex. It may negatively impact on working memory, which as I've discussed on this channel before, appears to be at the heart of our visual spatial scratch pad and highly useful for planning and taking action. From experience, the prefrontal cortex definitely can be useful during highly focused activity. So perhaps a flow state is really about being highly engaged with the activity, stimulating the release of excitatory neurotransmitters and hormones, but at the same time remaining calm enough in order to use those higher functioning brain regions as needed. 
This may also explain at least partly why flow states are also associated with the slower theta brainwaves. And this could all also be linked to something called heart rate variability. Heart rate variability refers to changes in our heart rate during inhalation and exhalation. Far from being steady, your heart rate fluctuates all the time, and this happens at least partly in response to your breath via the vagus nerve. When you breathe in, this causes a minor activation of the sympathetic nervous system, thereby increasing your heart rate. And when you breathe out, you trigger the parasympathetic nervous system, and thereby enter a more relaxed state. If your heart rate doesn't vary in this way, then it may suggest that you are sympathetic dominant, meaning that you're overstressed and possibly overtrained. You need more time to recover. But what's more is that this heart rate variability also seems to predict optimal performance in elite individuals such as Navy SEALs and Special Forces operatives. In fact, consistent top performers seem to have a different physiological stress response than average performers. It's been observed that Olympic caliber athletes and special operatives personnel demonstrate both stronger sympathetic responses to challenge and greater parasympathetic expression during rest. In other words, they're capable of being more on during competition and more off when they need to recover. Once again, things aren't quite as clear cut as they at first seem. While good heart rate variability is generally considered to be a good thing and positive for health and recovery, it actually seems that the top performers exhibit lower heart rate variability during extreme stresses or what is known as a metronomic heart rate. This suggests a much stronger sympathetic nervous system response. And somehow, top performers maintain this whilst also managing to remain clear-headed and focused. A doctor from Yale Medical School named Andy Morgan conducted fascinating research on the brains of men trained for mental resiliency under extreme stress. He found that they produced greater amounts of neuropeptide Y, or NPY, and DHEA. DHEA is interesting because it manages to buffer the effects of cortisol on the hippocampus, perhaps allowing athletes and special forces operatives to maintain their spatial awareness for heightening performance during stress. The HEA is also a neurosteroid that increases the excitability of neurons, potentially helping to speed up synaptic transmissions and helping our brain to run faster. NPY is meanwhile linked with blood pressure, appetite, learning and memory and helps us to reduce the effects of norepinephrine, thereby maintaining the usefulness of certain prefrontal brain regions during stress. Imagine turning on the gas in your brain, releasing performance enhancing neurochemicals and losing all distraction, while at the same time being able to maintain perfect clear headedness and possibly even enhanced reaction times. A related term is heart rate coherence. This plots the pattern of variability as either being erratic and all over the place or calm and steady. In other words, it measures how often the dip and peak in heart rate occur rather than how extreme those differences are. In a coherent state, the breathing becomes rhythmic, as do the heart rate variations. The heart rhythm patterns also become predictable. What's interesting is that coherence also correlates with an increase in DHEA and massive decrease in cortisol. So again, this might demonstrate that by breathing in a rhythmic and calm manner, we're able to maintain calm focus even when we're physiologically aroused. There was actually a study that looked for a correlation between heart rate coherence and other measures of flow states. The results were mixed, but there were some correlations suggesting either that there's a connection here, but there's a little bit more going on than just coherence, or that there were methodological problems with the study, which I would speculate is probably at least part of the reason for those findings. But there's definitely something of interest here that's worth exploring, and I'll be looking at that more in the next video. So this is certainly all speculation and I maintain that flow probably comes in a number of different forms. There's no one perfect physiological response to every situation, even though it'd be nice to think otherwise. But it seems that being able to stay calm during heightened sympathetic response is one of the keys to performing optimally. We want to increase arousal and motivation and vigilance during performance in dull tasks, but our aim is to control that response during competition or intense stress. We must be 100% focused to react reflexively and instinctively, whilst also being calm enough to prevent our brain function from shutting down. It's the difference between being psyched out and psyched up. And in part two of this video, I'll be looking at how we can tap into a flow state quickly and effectively using a number of flow hacks based on all of this theory. Actually decent ones that might work, including nootropic stacks for inducing flow. So there you go, I just wanted to shed a little bit of light onto flow states and how they may be a little bit more complicated and nuanced than a lot of people seem to think. 
Hope you found this video useful and interesting guys. If you did, then please like it, please share it around. It helps me greatly. Let me know in the comments down below what you think of flow state really is. If you want more information on this and links to all the studies that I referenced, then check out the link in the description down below and that'll take you to the accompanying blog post which goes with this video. Down there you'll also find links to my social media including Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and on there you can follow me, see what I'm doing in the gym, find out about new posts and videos etc. Likewise stay tuned and subscribe to this channel if you'd like more videos on brain training, performance, bodybuilding, fitness, technology, productivity, if that all sounds good, then thanks a ton for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.